Hello there. Today, I'm going to continue on 9.1 nervous system. And this time, I'm going to explain muscle contraction. There's going to be two parts to my discussion today. Firstly, I shall explain the individual roles of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a modified endoplasmic reticulum in the muscle. The calcium ions that are found in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the myofibrils, actin and myosin, as well as the T-tubules that are formed from the sarcolemma. Once I have explained all this, then I will move on to combine their function during muscle contraction based on the sliding filament hypothesis. But before you can follow my discussion on parts G and H here, make sure you have viewed my earlier video introducing the structure of the sarcomere so that the terms that I use in this video are not confusing to you. So let's move on. Before I can explain muscle contraction, let us compare the appearance of the muscle fiber or sarcomere between a muscle that is at rest or relaxed and a muscle that is contracted. When the muscle is relaxed, the actin filaments and the myosin filaments are quite far apart. They do not overlap so much. But if our muscle is contracted, like in this cartoon, the tricep muscle would be contracted to straighten the arm so that he can lift these books. So then that muscle will actually experience contraction. What will happen is the actin filaments will actually slide over the myosin filaments, causing the muscle here to appear shorter. So if we compare the diagram, you can see a muscle that is relaxed the Z lines will be further apart, making the sarcomere bigger. But when the muscle is contracted, the Z lines are closer together, making the sarcomere shorter. So this is known as the sliding filament hypothesis. Now that you have a rough idea of muscle contraction, let me go into the details. Once again, let's start the discussion with the muscle at rest. Let's look at what happens to the actin when your muscle is relaxed. Now remember, your actin molecules have four components. That is the globular actin molecule itself with the myosin binding site. And then the fibrous protein molecule called tropomyosin covering the myosin binding site and then you have the troponin placed on top of the tropomyosin and the troponin will have the calcium binding site. Now these four parts actually will combine together to form a complete structure like this where you can see when the actin is at rest the myosin binding site is actually covered by the tropomyosin. Next, we see what's happening to the myosin when the muscle is relaxed. As mentioned before, myosin has a head and a tail, as well as the enzyme ATPase on the head. When the muscle is at rest, the myosin head will lie close to the myosin tail and this is called a low energy configuration. Now that you are aware what is happening to both actin and myosin when the muscle is at rest, let's see the events that lead to the muscle contraction. Firstly, for muscle contraction to occur, impulse transmission must happen where the impulse must be received by the muscle tissues via the neuromuscular junction. To explain the process, I am going to use the diagram that I introduced in my video on the synapse, but I will modify the labels a little bit 
to represent the neuromuscular junction. So this neuron will specifically be the motor neuron. The space between the neuron and the muscle fiber will be the neuromuscular junction. The postsynaptic membrane here will not be of the dendrite but will be part of the myofibril. So the first thing to happen will be that the nerve impulse will arrive at the axon terminal or synaptic knob of the motor neuron. This is an electrical impulse. So as how I explained in the synapse discussion, an influx of sodium will occur. That influx of sodium will then stimulate the calcium ion voltage gated channels to open so that there will be an influx of calcium ions down the concentration gradient into the synaptic knob. The increasing concentration of the calcium ions will stimulate the synaptic vesicles to move down to the presynaptic membrane. Then exocytosis will occur to release the neurotransmitter called acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction. The neurotransmitter here is specifically acetylcholine because that is the most common neurotransmitter at the muscle tissues. Next, the acetylcholine molecules will diffuse down the concentration gradient across the neuromuscular junction to the postsynaptic membrane that is actually the sarcolemma of the myofibril. Once the neurotransmitter binds to the protein receptors, the sodium ion voltage gated channels will open and an influx of sodium ion will occur. The influx then will generate an EPSP which will then accumulate into threshold potential and finally an action potential. So this way, the sarcolemma becomes depolarized. Now in the synapse discussion, once an action potential is generated, then a chemical impulse will be converted into electrical impulse and transmitted along the axon. But this here is not an axon anymore, it is a muscle. So next I'm going to tell you what the action potential will do at the muscle. So here is the muscle tissue. Here is the sodium ion voltage gated channels. And inside here you have the myofibrils, that is the actin molecules and the myosin molecules wrapped by the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is storing the calcium ions. So what's going to happen now? The action potential that is caused by the increase in sodium ion concentration will spread throughout the sarcolemma and through the T-tubules which are there to increase surface area. So now, the sodium ion that are in the T-tubule will stimulate the calcium ion voltage gated channels located on the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open. So when the calcium ion voltage gated channels open, calcium ions that were in the sarcoplasmic reticulum will now diffuse out into the sarcoplasm and to the myofibrils that is both actin and myosin. So now we are going to learn the role of the calcium ions at actin and myosin. We start first with the actin molecule. Once the calcium ions arrive at the actin molecule, the calcium ion will bind to the troponin molecule because remember the troponin molecule has the calcium ion binding site. 
once the calcium ion binds to the troponin, it will actually make the troponin displace or move tropomyosin. So you can see now, once the tropomyosin has moved, the myosin binding site located on the actin is exposed. Please remember that the myosin binding site is located on the actin. It is not on the myosin. So if you see in this picture here, all the actin molecules are showing the myosin binding site because this string here, which is the tropomyosin, has been displaced. Okay, why it was displaced is because the troponin has calcium ion on it. So this is what's happened to the actin in the presence of the calcium ion. Let me go on to what happens to myosin once calcium is present. In the case of myosin, when the calcium ion binds to the enzyme ATPase, the calcium ion behaves like a cofactor to help activate ATPase. So this way, the ATP molecules can easily bind to the enzyme ATPase active site and become hydrolyzed into ADP and inorganic phosphate. When this occurs, energy is released. And what happens is that energy will be transferred to the myosin head to activate it to a higher energy configuration. So you can see the myosin head originally was lying close to the tail, but now the myosin head has become upright, or another term that we use is that the myosin head is cocked. So remember, the myosin molecule actually is made up of many myosin tails and heads. So you can see, like in this picture here, the myosin head is still at a low energy configuration. But over here, it is in a high energy configuration. So once both the actin molecule and the myosin molecule have been activated by the presence of the calcium ion, we see what happens next. The actin molecule has an exposed myosin binding site. The myosin molecule is in high energy configuration. So what happens, you can see, is now the myosin hit is attached to the myosin binding site on the actin molecule. This binding forms a cross bridge. We call that cross bridge as an ectomyosin cross bridge because it's half actin and half myosin. So this ectomyosin cross bridge binds actin filaments to the myosin filaments temporarily. Let me next explain what happens to make this cross bridge a temporary bridge. You see, once the cross bridge forms, the ADP and inorganic phosphate are released from the myosin head. When the ADP and inorganic phosphate leave the myosin head, the myosin head loses energy and takes on a low energy configuration. So that means the head will start to relax closer to the myosin tail. Now when it moves down, what happens is the cross bridge becomes flexed and eventually broken. And during that process, we find that the myosin head will actually move the actin filament towards the center of the sarcomere. This movement is what we call as the ratchet mechanism. Now, this process is not happening to only one actin 
and one myosin molecule. In a sarcomere, there are many actins and many myosins. So let me show you how it appears on a larger scale. The animation gives you a bigger picture of what is happening at the filaments. Once the myosin head takes on a low energy configuration because it has lost its ADP and inorganic phosphate, a new ATP molecule will bind to the myosin head, making the myosin head have a high energy configuration once again. So, the myosin head will bind to the myosin binding site on the actin to form a new cross bridge. So, the ratchet mechanism is repeated again and again, causing the whole actin molecule to slide upon the myosin. So, if you see in this picture here, eventually these actins up here will start to move inwards to the center of the sarcomere. This is what we call as the sliding filament hypothesis that explains muscle contraction. So next, I move on to explain the sliding filament hypothesis. Using simple lines, you can see the actin sliding over the myosin more easily. Of course, remember, between the places where the actin and the myosin overlap, there are supposed to be the ectomyosin cross bridges. So as the actin molecules slide over the myosin filaments, muscle contraction occurs. Now remember, the actin and the myosin themselves do not contract. They remain the same length. It is only the actin that is sliding over the myosin. Keep in mind, it is not myosin sliding over actin. Myosin is static. It is the actin that can move. So when writing your sentence, be very clear. Actin filaments slide over myosin filaments. Please take note that during the muscle contraction, based on the sliding filament hypothesis, the muscle alone doesn't contract, but it is actually the individual sarcomeres that are contracting. And while the sarcomere contracts, you find that the eye band becomes shorter, that is the place where there are only actin filaments, they become smaller because there is more overlap. However, the A-band, the A-band, remember, is the border of the myosin bands. Okay, they remain constant because the A-band is not moving. And then the H-zone. The H-zone is the location where there is only myosin. Also becomes shorter because the actin filaments are coming closer to the M-line. So these points are necessary to remember for objective questions, usually. Now your muscle has contracted, but muscles cannot remain contracted forever because this process requires use of ATP. So once you have not enough ATP or the impulse has stopped arriving, the muscle will have to relax. So let me next explain how the muscle relaxes. I mentioned just now, the nerve impulse will stop. Therefore, the calcium ions will not be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum anymore. Instead, the calcium ions now will be taken up actively into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, without the calcium ions in the sarcoplasm area, we find that the calcium ions are not available to bind to troponin anymore. 
this will cause the troponin to move back the tropomyosin onto the myosin binding site. Okay, now without calcium ions, troponin is unable to displace the tropomyosin. So, tropomyosin returns to its original location, causing the myosin site to become closed. At the myosin, the calcium ions will also be actively transported back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, without calcium ions, the ATPase is not activated anymore. So, ATP is not going to bind, ATP is not going to be hydrolyzed, so the myosin head will not have energy to be in high energy configuration, so it will go back to the position closer to the tail, that is the low energy configuration. Because of that, you see that the actin filaments and the myosin filaments become far apart. There are no more cross bridges between them. So the actin will move back to its original position. Okay, the ratchet mechanism cannot occur anymore without the cross bridge. So the actins do not slide over the myosin anymore and the muscle becomes relaxed once again. that I shall relax just as you can relax until my next video. See you next time.